Let us now look at the muscles of the anterior abdominal wall. This is the umbilicus. The skin, superficial fascia, and fat have been removed to expose the muscles. This white shiny stuff that we see is the aponeurosis of these muscles. The aponeurosis of the muscles from the two sides meets in the midline structure called linea alba because it's relatively avascular. The muscle which extends straight down next to the midline on either side is the rectus abdominis. It extends from the lower few costal cartilages above to the uh, pubic bone uh, below. This muscle here is the external oblique. You're only seeing part of it. The rest of it has been cut off where it was attached to the ribs. And you can see that its fibers are pointing downwards and pointing medially. It meets its other fellow from the opposite side in the midline linea alba. And this muscle always goes anterior to the rectus abdominis. Lying deep to the external oblique is the muscle in the middle. That is the internal oblique. The fibers of the internal oblique go in the opposite direction as compared to the external oblique. The internal oblique, once it reaches this position, the lateral border of the rectus abdominis, divides partly to go anterior to the rectus and partly to go posterior to the rectus abdominis. This is the deepest layer of the muscles, and this is the transversus abdominis. If I turn this specimen, you would see that lying deep to the transversus abdominis on the inside here is the parietal peritoneum. On this side, the rectus abdominis has been removed along with the anterior wall of the rectus sheath. So what I'm pointing to now is the posterior wall of the rectus sheath. And you may be able to appreciate that at this point, there is a little arch-like line called the arcuate line. Below the arcuate line, the posterior wall of the rectus sheath is rather thin because it is formed just by fascia transversalis lying overlying on the peritoneum, whereas on this part, the posterior wall of the rectus sheath is thicker. The reason for the wall being thinner of the arcuate line here is that in this lower part, in the lower third of the uh, sheath, the aponeurosis of all the three abdominal muscles, the external, internal, and transversus pass anterior to the rectus abdominis. And also in this portion, the aponeurosis of the external oblique is quite separate, whereas the aponeurosis of the internal and transversus is joined together to form the conjoint tendon. Right here, you're seeing a branch of an artery this is the inferior epigastric artery, a branch coming off the external iliac, and this enters the rectus sheath at that point at the awkward line and ascends upwards to anastomose with the superior epigastric artery, which is a continuation or a branch of the internal thoracic. We are looking at the posterior aspect of the anterior abdominal wall. All this is the peritoneum. This is the location of the umbilicus. And deep to the peritoneum are three structures that were functioning in the fetus. Any idea what they might be? In the midline, connecting the bladder to the umbilicus is the remains of the uricus, and on either side of that are the obliterated umbilical arteries. This here 
is the inferior epigastric artery. As the peritoneum goes over these structures, it raises certain folds which are called median umbilical fold overlying the urecus, medial umbilical fold overlying the umbilical artery obliterated, and lateral umbilical fold overlying the inferior epigastric artery. This, by the way, is the rectus abdominis. This is the inguinal ligament. It is formed by the lower free border of the aponeurosis of the external oblique muscle. It is attached laterally to the anterior superior iliac spine and medially to the pubic uh, tubercle. Some of the fibers extend from the pubic tubercle to the pubic ramus that you can see on the inside better than out here. And those fibers constitute what is the lacunar ligament. And that lacunar ligament forms the boundary of the uh, femoral canal. This is the superficial inguinal ring, which is a little defect in the aponeurosis of the external oblique. And if there is a superficial ring, there must be a deep. And there is. The deep inguinal ring is in the fascia transversalis. I cannot show that to you in this view, but it would be in this location right here. And lying medial to the deep inguinal ring is the inferior epigastric artery, which is a branch of the external iliac. The space connecting the superficial inguinal ring and the deep inguinal ring is the inguinal canal. There are two nerves that traverse the superficial inguinal ring. One is the genital branch of the genitofemoral that supplies the cremaster muscle and the skin of the scrotum in males or just the skin of the labium majus and the mons pubis in females. The other nerve is the ilioinguinal nerve, and that supplies the skin, a little bit of skin on the medial side of the thigh, and some of the skin in the perineum. There is another structure that traverses this superficial inguinal ring, and that structure is different in two sexes. In females, the structure traversing is the round ligament of the uterus, which comes out through this and then just ends in the mons pubis. And in males, coming out through this opening is the spermatic cord. Even though you cannot see the deep inguinal ring in this view, I want you to think about the structures that would be traversing the deep inguinal ring. It would be the genital branch of the genitofemoral nerve. And in addition to that, in females, there will be the round ligament of the uterus that would traverse the deep inguinal ring. In males, the structures traversing in addition to the genital branch of genitofemoral nerve would be the vas deferens and the testicular vessels. We are looking at the inferior aspect of the diaphragm. That is the xiphoid process. Here is the vertebral body. This here is the upturned edge of the anterior abdominal wall. Same way on this side. Note the diaphragm here. And you can almost see the light coming through this tendinous part, the central tendon of the diaphragm. This opening in the central tendon is for the inferior vena cava. Can you recall another structure that traverses the same opening? Yes, it is the right phrenic nerve. Right here is the esophageal hiatus through which the esophagus comes into the abdomen. This nerve that is lying along with that 
traversing the same opening that I'm holding now. This is the anterior vagal trunk. The anterior as well as the posterior vagal trunks traverse the esophageal hiatus. This trunk here is the celiac trunk coming directly off the aorta. And these are the three main branches from the celiac trunk. This one is the common hepatic. Here is the left gastric. And this is the splenic. And you can see as I trace the splenic artery, right here is the spleen. It goes all the way across to the spleen. Quite close to it, close to the celiac trunk, but a little inferior is this artery, which is the superior mesenteric artery. This structure here is the splenic vein. And this white stuff that you're seeing is in the cut edge of the superior mesenteric vein. And so you see the superior mesenteric vein joins with the splenic vein to form the portal vein. This is the right renal artery. Here is the left renal vein, which is covering the renal artery. Right here is the kidney, and this is the ureter. Another branch that you can see coming off the aorta right here, that is the gonadal artery. This one here is the inferior mesenteric, and you're not seeing much of that, but that's what this is. This, of course, is the cut edge of the abdominal aorta. This here, perhaps you can appreciate, is the lumbar artery. There are four pairs of lumbar arteries which arise from the abdominal aorta. The right kidney has been removed, so you can see that these muscles here form the posterior relations of the kidney. This one is the psoas major, and here is the quadratus lumborum. This is the twelfth rib, and lying just below that is the subcostal nerve. 